I guess we've gotten the message. Well, good morning. It's great to be with you this morning uh, at the Ministry of the Word service at Believer's Chapel. We're glad to see so many faces here this morning, and uh, hopefully we continue to increase uh, the numbers each week. I want to read to you from chapter 1 of Joshua, verse 9. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, do not be frightened, and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. We can take great encouragement in that uh, this morning. And now let's begin our worship with the singing of our first hymn. Well, we don't have many announcements uh, this morning. Uh, If you are getting the email bulletin, you know we're continuing to look for volunteers in the nursery. So if you are uh, able to help out during this service uh, with the young children, please reach out to Sarah Terrell. Uh, There are classes that are meeting and that are getting together in person here at the chapel. I know Wednesday nights, the Peculiar People class meets. Uh, They're meeting together. And then this evening, uh, the men's book study will meet. So we will meet in the East Parlor and we'll be able to Uh, socially distance, so you can feel good about coming. I'll actually be facilitating the study tonight, so if you don't come, I'll take it personally. (laughs) So just know we're taking role. That's really all of the announcements this morning, so now Dan will come up and read our scripture reading for this morning. Dan. Thank you, Seth, and good morning to all of you. It's uh, good to see your faces some I haven't seen in months. And so it's good that we're getting back. And for those of you who are watching, uh, good morning to you as well. We are in our second lesson in a series in 2 Thessalonians. We're going to look at the rest of chapter 1, beginning with verse 6 through verse 12. And I will read the text, and then we'll have a word of prayer. 2 Thessalonians... Chapter 1, verse 6, for after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to those to, to you who are afflicted and to us as well when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power when He comes to be glorified in His saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have believed, for our testimony to you was believed. To this end also we pray for you always, that our God will count you worthy of your calling and fulfill every desire for goodness and for the work of faith with power, so that the name of our Lord Jesus will be glorified in you and you in Him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless His reading of His Word and bless our time of studying it together, let's bow in a word of prayer. Father, again, it's a great blessing to be with your people on a Lord's Day. And we thank you for the beauty of this day and thank you for all who have come and the opportunity to to be together and to begin this reopening, but to be here together with, with each other, fellowshipping and We pray that you would bless our time here. We pray for those that are watching that you would bless them too with the exposition of this word. It's your word. It's your revelation. It's a serious material that the apostle deals with here. Given to be an encouragement to your people and I pray that it will be as we consider it and consider the the world in which we live and the challenges that we face. But as Paul reminds us, we have hope regardless of what we experience and we do go through difficulties in life and we're going through those at this time 
of a different kind from those that the Thessalonians were dealing with, but, but tribulations nonetheless, and yet we have hope, as Paul encouraged them with, and we have also the encouragement that, that you are working with us, and we're to be praying for that, that you are ministering to us continually in order that we would continue faithfully to the end. So, Lord, we do pray that for ourselves at this time. We pray that you would encourage us with the hope that we have for the future and the assurance that we have presently that you are working for us, you are helping us, you are guiding us and enabling us to live a life that is uh, faithful to you and helpful to one another. Bless us, Lord, spiritually in this way with this kind of encouragement. And then we do pray for our material needs and our condition. We pray for those who have particular needs, um, whose health has been compromised. We pray that you would bless and uh, encourage. We think of Audrey. It's good to see her here this morning. We pray for Madeline and pray for uh, Margaret and Betty Radford and others, Lord, we uh, pray for Gwen Phillips and pray that you would continue to give her health and strength and Walt as well and others, Lord, who may have been affected by this virus and pray that you would give healing and pray that you would give protection to the rest of us and keep us active and keep us healthy. Uh, we live and move and exist in you. That's what Paul told the Athenian philosophers in Acts 17, every breath that we take is a gift from you. Every beat of our heart, every moment of our existence is a gift from you. And what we know, Lord, is you're faithful and you do watch over us, guide us and take care of us. And so, Lord, we we thank you for that. We pray your blessing upon us and we pray your blessing upon this nation. We pray that you would bless our leaders with wisdom and we pray that, that soon this will end and, and things will return to normalcy. But it's in your hands and we can rest in that. And we do. And now, Lord, we look to you to bless us, to build us up in the faith and to equip us for the day and the week ahead. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. One of the greatest invitations ever given is the one Christ gave in Matthew chapter 11. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That is just what the soul weighed down with guilt, needs to hear the promise of rest. But an easy yoke isn't an easy life. And anyone who expects, as Isaac Watts warned, to be born to paradise on flowery beds of ease will be disappointed. Jesus told his disciples in John 16, verse 33, the world... In the world, you have tribulation. That was a kindness on his part. Forewarned is forearmed. The easy yoke is God's sovereign grace that enables the Christian to do what would otherwise be impossible. Live well in hard times. Overcome hardship and tribulation as the Thessalonians did. In verse 4, Paul said that they were enduring persecutions and afflictions. Yet he said they were growing in their faith and increasing in love for each other. Now that is the easy yoke of grace. But they also needed hope. And in the rest of the chapter, Paul gives that with the promise that God will give the suffering saints rest when Christ returns to judge the persecutors 
and exonerate them, His people. So, persevere. That's the application. And to ensure that they did, Paul prayed for them. That's how the chapter ends. To this end also, we pray for you always. So, this passage is about hope for the future and help for the present. 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 6 through 12, then, is a word for the weary warrior. Hold on. Fight on. Victory is certain. Glory is coming. You are more than conquerors. But again, victory is still future. Paul says in verse 7, it will be when the Lord Jesus Christ will be revealed from heaven. But it will be complete. Verse 6, he will repay with affliction those who afflict. The New International Version has, he will, he will pay back trouble to those who trouble you. Now, to modern ears, that sounds harsh, uh, even unchristian. More Old Testament than New Testament. God is love, and Jesus is gentle. And, of course, that is true. Uh, Jesus said in that invitation that I read in Matthew 11, verse 29, I am gentle and humble in heart. But that's not the whole truth. And a half-truth is a whole lie. God is love, John tells us. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. Great verse, an important verse. I remember hearing Dr. Johnson in one of his sermons say that uh, when they had their first child, their son, he would uh, come into the room where Sam was sleeping in his crib, and he would say, God is love. 1 John 4, 8. And he'd always repeat that. From the, so he started from the very beginning teaching his son the Scriptures. And that's a great verse to begin with. God is love. Uh, that is a great and glorious truth. We cannot overestimate the greatness of the, of the fact that God Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, is love. In fact, He loves so much that He sent His own Son to die for sinners, for the ungodly, the just for the unjust. That is the definition of love. But it's also true, and the teaching of the New Testament, that God is a consuming fire. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29. But I agree, this does have a whiff of the Old Testament. Leviticus 24, verse 20. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth. The law of retaliation, as it is often called. But that too, that verse, that concept, has been greatly misunderstood. It's not about knocking out uh, teeth and poking out eyes uh, in, in a kind of gleeful vengeance. It's about justice. Exact reciprocity. Punishment that is fair, that fits the crime. Exactly equal to the offense. As moral judge of the universe, God cannot ignore sin. To do so is not good, and to do so is not love. He is holy. He will judge sin. And that is only right. And that's what Paul says here. He says, it is only just that he do this. Now, so there's no contradiction here. There must be redress for crime. Regardless of modern notions of God and uh, selective readings of the Bible, Scripture is clear. God will judge sin. He will restore righteousness in the world and repay persecutors with justice. But it's not only about payback for the wicked. It's also about relief for the righteous. Verse 7, to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven. This word relief can also be translated rest. 
And it often is translated that way. For example, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13, Paul wrote, I had no rest for my spirit, not finding Titus my brother. And he finally got rest for his spirit when he found Titus. And I think that is the better translation here. When judgment occurs and things are set right, wrongs are righted, then there will be rest for the soul, the spirit. Revelation 6 applies to this. The seal judgments begin on the earth and with the fifth seal, John sees in heaven the martyrs under the altar crying for justice, saying, How long, O Lord? They, they ask, When will their blood be avenged? And they're told to rest for a little while longer. It will happen in God's time. Now, that's a different word for rest than we have here, but it's the same idea. Rest is given with the assurance of justice. Paul was giving the same encouragement here to the Thessalonians by telling them that final rest for their souls, peace in spirit will come when Christ returns. So they were not to despair, but hope in that. He then describes the future event in the remainder of verse 7 and verse 8, and uh, does so in vivid language. Christ will be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. The uh, English Standard Version translates retribution as vengeance, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God. That's a good translation, but it, it doesn't have the idea of vindictiveness. There, there's nothing spiteful or cruel in this. The word is based on one, one that's uh, translated righteous and just in verses 5 and 6. And it's been defined as unwavering justice. That's the idea here. One of the older commentators put it this way. It is the inflicting of full justice on the criminal. Nothing more, nothing less. Full justice. What will happen, what Paul is describing here, will be fair and well-deserved. But there's another side to this. And that is the Lord's patience with those who are deserving justice. 2,000 years have passed since Paul wrote these words. Persecutors and persecution are still with us. God could have snuffed out these people long ago, ended this worldwide rebellion and established justice on the earth centuries ago, millennia ago. But he has another plan, one of grace and mercy. He's patiently gathering his elect from all the nations and down through the generations. Peter explained this in 2 Peter 3, verse 9. And he is giving rebels opportunity to lay down their arms and repent. It's uh, Ezekiel 18, verse 32, where the Lord said, I have no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies. Therefore, repent and live. That's God's desire. It's the, the picture given of him in Isaiah chapter 65, verse 2. I have spread out my hands all day long to a rebellious people, a, re a, a people who continually provoke me to my face. Now, what a description that is. Provoke me to my face, to the face of the Lord God of the universe, and yet he is patient with them, spreading out his hands in an invitation for them to come. Now, that's the patience of God, but eventually God's patience will run out. And it will be in agreement with his perfect plan. But then Christ will come with his mighty angels in flaming fire and inflict vengeance, justice on the world. Paul identifies the guilty in two ways here. Those who 
do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel. Now, this may be two different types of people that he is referring to, but I take this as a description of the same persons. They don't know God because they don't obey the gospel. Well, we might have expected Paul to say that they do not believe the gospel, but there's little difference. Unbelief is disobedience to the call to believe. But disobey or not obey lays particular stress on their guilt. Rejection of the gospel is rejection of God's revelation and His gift and sacrifice of His own Son. That is the greatest guilt there is. And in God's court, punishment always fits the crime. And the sin of rejecting Christ, rejecting His sacrifice and His invitation, merits the greatest punishment. And so, Paul says in verse 9, these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. That's the judgment to come. Eternal punishment. But what is the nature of it? There are some who interpret the word destruction as meaning annihilation, and not eternal conscious suffering. And taken by itself, the phrase could be interpreted in that way. But we never read a passage in isolation, but always in the, in the larger context of Scripture. One of the rules for uh, correct, solid interpretation is Scripture interprets Scripture. So we bring all of Scripture to bear on a text like this. And there's nothing in Paul's writings that suggests he believed in annihilationism. The Lord certainly didn't. He spoke of the eternal nature of hell in Matthew 25 and Mark chapter 9 of eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels and the place where the Lord said their, their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Well, there's no reason for the fire to be eternal and their worm to be undying if there is no one there to be punished by them. The fact that those instruments of pain are eternal indicates that the torment will be eternal. The Apostle John clearly wrote of eternal punishment. In Revelation 20, verse 10, the lake of fire and brimstone is described as the place where unbelievers will be tormented day and night forever and ever. What, what could that mean other than endless punishment? There's also proof of that from the Apocrypha, where this expression eternal destruction occurs one time. It's in 4th Maccabees, and there it refers to the eternal punishment of a tyrant. Well, it's not Scripture, but it does give some support for the thinking of that day. But even Paul's description of the punishment here in verse 9 doesn't fit the notion of annihilation. It is separation from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. It goes without saying that, that if they are annihilated, they are excluded from the Lord's presence. That really adds nothing to this statement. For their exclusion to have any significance, they must be in existence and be aware of what they have been separated from, what they will not be allowed to enjoy. Otherwise, it's not punishment. Leon Morris's explanation of this punishment is helpful. He derives it from the blessing of eternal life which differs from, from this present life uh, in both duration and quality. It is without end, and it is pure, and it is rich beyond our comprehension. Eternal destruction is the opposite. It is endless. It is forever, but with a negative quality. 
It is the end and ruin of all that is worthwhile in life. In John 17, verse 3, Christ defined eternal life as knowing God, the Father and Himself, the Son. It is knowing about Him, and in knowing about Him, it is knowing Him personally in an ever-growing relationship. Eternal destruction is the opposite. It is separation from the Lord, from the knowledge of Him, the glory of Him, the, the joy of His fellowship. It is banishment from the light to the darkness. Christ promises the believer a full life. That's one of the great promises we have in the Gospel of John. In John 10, verse 10, He promises abundant life. Eternal destruction is exile to meaningless existence forever. Morris called it the final disaster. But in that we see justice. How punishment fits the crime. They did not want to know God, so they will be excluded from Him and with all of the consequences of that. What can be fairer? They will be given over to the life that they chose, forever living with their guilt and the constant sting of their conscience without relief or rest because they rejected the only solution, which is Christ's sacrifice. It's, as Morris said, the final disaster. And he added, the solemnity of this should not be minimized. The tragedy and the ruin of it cannot be overemphasized or exaggerated. Paul knew well the solemnity of it. It's the reason he told the Corinthians that as Christ's ambassadors, that's what they were, that's what you and I are as believers in Christ, Christ's ambassadors, the Lord appealed to men through them, through the apostle, through you and through me. We beg you, he said, this is the appeal that we make. On behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Lay down your arms. Believe in Christ the Savior. And certainly the Thessalonian Christians would have, have wanted that of their persecutors. There's no joy in thinking of this torment that's to come. And I'm sure that many of them made that appeal as they were going through hardship and persecution, and they no doubt said to their persecutors, be reconciled, flee the wrath to come. But the assurance Paul is giving here is that those who do not do that, who reject Christ and His offer of forgiveness and life everlasting, those rebels would not prevail. The Thessalonians would. God's people will. That is only just, Paul said. It is right. It must happen if God is holy, just, and good, if things in this broken world are ever to be set right. He must come as judge and deal with all that's been wrong. It will happen. Evil will be defeated and punished, and the assurance that wrong will be repaid and everything will be made right, gave rest, peace, to the spirits of those persecuted saints. But there's more here. Paul's encouragement is not only negative, it's also positive. In, in verse 10, he tells them that not only will the guilty be punished, but they, the saints, will be exonerated. When Christ comes, He will come, Paul says, to be glorified in His saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have believed, for our testimony to you was believed. Now that's an amazing statement. When Christ comes, He will come in radiant glory. And His glory will be among the saints 
in their presence and marveled at by them. But Paul is saying something more than that. He's saying that when he comes, Christ will be glorified in them. That his glory will be seen in them. Calvin has a good statement uh, about this when he says that Paul means Christ will not possess this glory for himself alone, but, will share, but, it, but it will be shared among all the saints. Believers are the Lord's saints. Every believer is a saint. Every believer is one who has been set apart. That's really what the word saint means. Those who have been set apart for the Lord's service. Those who have been devoted to the Lord's service. And if you're a believer in Christ, that's what you are. You've been devoted to the service of the Lord. You've been set apart from the world. You're different from the world. And you live that way. We have His life in us, which enables us to do that. When He comes, that life in us and its glory will be fully revealed. We have that life in us now, but it is hidden, as it were, in clay vessels. But then it will be seen. It's His glory that will glow brightly in, in, in all of His people. And we're going to be transformed spiritually. We're going to be transformed physically. And I think it is true that to the degree we live as saints and faithfully serve Him from love and gratitude, to that degree we will reflect His life and glory in the days to come and throughout eternity. We will have greater capacity to do that. This is what Paul referred to in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, where he was encouraging the saints in Corinth to press on in the faith and not lose heart. The first century church was under great pressure and difficulty and facing all kinds of trials, not only in Thessalonica, but in Corinth and all throughout the, the Mediterranean world. And so he's giving encouragement. And to encourage them not to lose heart, he wrote to these Corinthians, for momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. And that seems to be the encouragement that he was giving here to the Thessalonians. Their endurance in all of their persecutions and afflictions were not wasted on the Lord. They were, were really light or weightless in comparison to the glory that those tribulations were producing in them and that will someday be seen in them. So they were not to lose heart. They were to continue on increasing in faith and growing greater in love. As he said earlier, they were doing being a blessing to others and being a, a witness for the Lord. And in that day, as Paul puts it, when Christ comes to right wrongs and establish righteousness on the earth, He will be glorified in them, in the saints. They will be models of His glory and grace. Models of grace because as Calvin said, Christ chooses to share His glory with us and shine it through us. That will magnify His grace and exonerate His saints before a conquered world. Now, that is incentive to go on in the faith against all opposition. Someday, the guilty will be repaid, punished, and the innocent, the saints, will be glorified. That is a promise. It is a, a certainty for the believer in Jesus Christ and encouraging. But Paul wrote this letter because his friends were facing strong opposition. So in the last verse, 
He prays for them and begins saying that he prayed to this end. But he doesn't specify what that end is. It may simply be that, they, that the end that he prayed for is that they would finish well their life of faith. His prayer has, has two parts that would seem to support that as the idea, that he's praying for their perseverance. The first is that God would count them worthy of their calling. Now, he doesn't say that God would make them worthy. We are worthy in Christ. Uh, it, it is all of grace, not human merit. We can't achieve God's acceptance. The Christian begins at the moment of faith, justified, forgiven, declared by God to be righteous with the gift of Christ's righteousness. Absolutely. From the moment of faith, we are justified and we can't become more justified than we are. It's complete. So there's no room for trying to please God and gain His favor to any degree. We are completely in His favor through justification at the moment of faith. That's how we begin. We begin the Christian life with faith and acceptance fully by God. But now we must live up to that declaration of righteousness. We must live up to our position of justified and righteous. So Paul's prayer is that they would do that. That they would live worthy of their calling. Not become distracted or discouraged. That's a, a prayer we always need made for us. We always need people praying that for us. And we need to be praying it continually, always, as Paul says, for one another. If you want to know how to pray for one another, here's how we should do it. And pray that we will continue to, to live out the life that uh, the Lord has given to us. And that we would live up to the position and the privilege that He has given us as justified individuals, that God will enable us to persevere in the faith to the end. Not long ago, I was reading uh, in the biography of David Martin Lloyd-Jones a letter that he wrote in 1968 in which he spoke of the condition of the church. First, the condition at, at Westminster Chapel in London where he ministered, and as I recall, he wrote the letter to his congregation there. And, and he was very encouraged and thankful as he reflected on the church and the life of the church there at Westminster Chapel. He wrote, there was a deep seriousness among us and an ever-increasing desire to know God and to serve Him. Now, that was their ambition. They wanted to know God. They wanted to know about Him. They wanted to increase in their relationship with Him. And they wanted to serve Him. But when he spoke of the evangelical church at large throughout the world, it was different. There, there was confusion and uncertainty, division over matters of faith, uncertainty about the authority of Scripture. He wrote, It is a time of conflict and trial, indeed a time of tragedy, when old comrades in arms are now in different camps. Now he didn't question their honesty and their sincerity, but he said, there is only one explanation, and that is, an enemy hath done this. Never has, never has that enemy been more active or more subtle, he, he wrote. He ended by saying that we can't know what the outcome will be. And we can't know the outcome of this present conflict we are in. Now that was in 1968, and we can say the same thing today. We can't know the outcome of the conflict that we're in spiritually, theologically, and all that's going on. He wrote, our duty is to be faithful knowing that the final outcome is sure. 
Well, that was Paul's concern here. That's what he was praying for. That those young Thessalonian Christians, these new comrades in arms, would stay in the camp. Satan is subtle and so persuasive. Paul's prayer here for the Thessalonians is one we need to be praying for ourselves always that we continue to fight the good fight and be faithful to the Lord. That's our duty and we will triumph. We don't know how it's going to end in the meantime, in the present, in the next year or two or whatever, but we know ultimately we will triumph and be glorified. That's what Paul is saying here. The second part of his prayer for them is that God would fulfill every desire for goodness and the work of faith with power. The, the good desires we have, the, the righteous conduct God commands, and we desire as new creatures in Christ, as, as those who are men and women with a new mind, a new person, we, we desire goodness. We desire to do the things that we have been instructed to do, to live a life of obedience, a life of righteousness, which we live by faith. We live by faith, believing God's revelation and acting on it. Paul wants that life of faithful obedience fulfilled in their lives. But by asking God, fulfill it, shows that while they, while we are responsible, we cannot achieve that in our own strength. We cannot achieve that apart from the Lord. Human power is inadequate. God's power is necessary. We have our responsibilities. We have the, the direction and the path that we're to follow, and the Scriptures are clear about how we're to behave and how we're to think. But to do it, we need the power of the Lord. And Paul reinforces that by adding that, God's, that, that God fulfill it with power. And so his prayer was that God would do it. It's really Augustine's prayer in his confessions. Give what you command and command what you will. I can do whatever you command me to do, Lord, if you enable me to do it. And that's what Paul is praying here. But the, the goal of Paul's prayer for the Thessalonians is not God giving them ability for faithful behavior. At least that's not the ultimate goal of his prayer here. It is higher than that. It is that Christ be glorified through it. That's really the end and aim of all things in the Christian life. Verse 12 so that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ will be glorified in you and you in Him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. The name is the person the name represents. So when he speaks of the name of our Lord being glorified, he means the one that name represents. It means the Lord Himself. And He will be glorified in His saints, by their good behavior, which shows the transforming power of His grace. So again, Paul says, we too, His saints, will be glorified at that time, not because of anything natural to us, not because of anything we've merited or done, but because we are in Him, joined to Him and His life. It is by His grace, Paul says. That's the future for the people of God. So we're to persevere in the meantime. We're to persevere in the hard times and glorify Christ through our obedience, knowing that He is coming and will exonerate His saints, glorify us, and give us rest. The Thessalonians were assured justice will be established. 
their persecutors would be repaid righteously, justly, by being excluded from Christ's presence forever. Now that should make us think. If separation from Christ, from His presence and glory, is the dreadful punishment, what must the blessing of being in His presence be? How great must that be? What is heaven like? What is the world to come like? What is the glory that we are moving toward like? Well, Paul gives a hint of that in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9, where he says, I have not seen nor ear heard all that God has prepared for those who love Him. In other words, we cannot imagine what it's like. The best efforts at imagining what it's like fall far short, infinitely short. Imagination fails us. The revelation God has given us is really analogical. It is just illustrative of what it's going to be like. It's beyond our comprehension. We are to live earnestly now to God's glory, which means live selflessly for Him. But we do that by fixing our thoughts on the future rest, the glory to come, and the Savior who loves us and gained all of it for us. If you've not believed in Christ, your soul is in peril. You may not think so. Life may be good today, but eternal destruction is coming. Don't dismiss that. Listen to the apostle. Flee the final disaster. Come to Christ. And for you, whose soul may be weighed down with guilt, one of the greatest invitations ever given is in Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Maybe he's calling you right now. Come to Him. Believe in Him. Be forgiven and receive eternal life. May God help you to do that if that is your condition now. Come to faith. Come to Christ. And you who have, rejoice. Persevere. Look to the Lord. Let's bow in a word of prayer. And I'm going to, as I do every Sunday conclude this ministry of the Word, but also ask the Lord to prepare our hearts for a time of worship as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper. Let's pray. Father, we do thank You for Your goodness to us. We thank You for Your revelation. The things that we have read and studied here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 are not easy things. They're difficult. They should be. They speak of justice and judgment and uh, we would, as ambassadors, plead with those who are in unbelief to be reconciled to God, to lay down their arms and come to Christ, and in coming to Christ, come to you in, and be in, at peace and be part of your family. Lord, I pray that you would bring conviction where that is necessary, but I pray also that you give comfort where it is appropriate. And really, we all need that great comfort to know that everything is going to be resolved in the future. In your time and in your way. And glory is coming. We have a glorious inheritance that Christ has obtained for us. We give you thanks for that. We thank you for the Lord Jesus for His coming into this world and His death for us. And now, Lord, as we celebrate this Lord's Supper again this Sunday, we pray that You would prepare our hearts for it. We pray that You would help us to put the thoughts of the day aside 
and to reflect on who he is and what he's done, that we would, as he instructed us to do, remember him. And in so doing, I pray that you would prepare us for the day ahead of us and the week ahead of us. Thank you for Christ. Thank you for all that he's done for us. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Betsy. Thanks, Elizabeth. We've heard much about glory from our passage of Scripture this morning. Christ coming to be glorified in his saints on that future day. His name being glorified in us. I would suggest that in our observance of the Lord's Supper, we're called to remember that which served to bring about the greatest display of glory ever conceived, uh, most majestically displayed in the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, offering of himself on the cross of Calvary. If the definition of glory and its related verb glorified is excellencies revealed or made known, then what God in Christ revealed in the mission of the cross was the most excellent accomplishment ever obtained. That is because all that God is, is revealed at the cross. His righteousness and holiness, his justice and peace, his mercy and grace and love, they were all put on display in majestic harmony when the holy and perfect Son of God condescended to become a real man, lived a life completely in accordance with his Father's will for him, and then offered himself an atoning sacrifice for the sins of sinners. The scriptures as a whole proclaim the glory of such Excellence, and before we partake of the bread now, I, I want to remind you of just two of the, the many. Uh, the first is found in Luke's account of the transfiguration of Jesus on the mount in Luke chapter 9. You remember that is when the Lord took Peter and James and John with him, and the gospel writers tell us that he was transfigured before them, and his face so shone like the sun and his garments became as white as light. Uh, for the briefest of moments, the three disciples were allowed a, a sliver of a glimpse at his true glory. And Luke describes how Moses and Elijah appeared, and, and they too were glorious in appearance. But Luke is the gospel writer who tells us of the topic of their conversation. Appearing in glory, this is what Luke records, they were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. So in this unusual tryst, the topic that bound them in conversation was the upcoming gateway to glory that the cross was to provide. That was the glorious subject of the faithful laborers and their Lord. Well, of course, his glory would be on their minds. That was on the Lord's mind, especially in the evening before the cross when, and here's the second passage I want to mention, uh, during his high priestly prayer in John chapter 17, Jesus prayed, I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. On the one hand, that's all Jesus ever wanted to do. He said it over and over again. He only did what the Father showed him to do. He only said what the Father gave him uh, to say, and that included the cross to which he steadfastly, even at that moment, was making his way so certain of accomplishing it, that he could speak of it as if it had, he had already endured it. And in his perfect obedience, he glorified the Father on this earth. So that now, in verse 5 of John chapter 17, it's, it's not as though he means to somehow trade in that glory for another 
glory. It's just that now he will have laid down the basis for which his former glory would be restored to him. He had never lost it. He had only laid it aside temporarily. It is glory upon glory. The humiliation over. His throne rightfully restored. For the joy set before him, he would endure the cross and and then be raised from the dead to ascend back to the right hand of his father and the scene would be the fulfillment of what Paul so aptly, the apostle Paul so aptly described in those verses in Philippians 2, wherefore also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of of God the Father. In our remembrance, we magnify him as we now partake of this bread. Let us contemplate the majesty of a loving Savior who suffered the wrath of God on our behalf that we might receive forgiveness and the hope of eternal life. He said, this is my body given for you do this in remembrance of me. If you're here with us and you belong to the Lord Jesus and you have that hope, we invite you to participate with us now as we observe his supper. Let me give thanks for the bread. Father, thank you for this time together uh, for centuries now in obedience to your command that evening, the night in which you were betrayed, Uh, Your church, your people have gathered and they have done what we are now doing, gathered around the table of the Lord with the bread and, and, and the cup with the wine in it to remember what those elements represent. They uh, represent uh, the body of the Lord Jesus Christ offered a sacrifice for us. So we thank you now as we partake the bread for the love behind that sacrifice, for the hope that it brought us. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. As we prepare for the cup, I want to consider Paul's statement in Colossians chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, which briefly and simply states the person and work of Christ, who he is, and what he did. It reminds us that he is sufficient for every need and challenge that we may face because he lacks nothing and he has done everything. Paul writes in verse 19, for It was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in Him. And through Him to reconcile all things to Himself, having made peace through the blood of His cross. Through Him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Verse 19 defines the person of Christ, who He is. The fullness that dwells in Him is deity. He is fully God. All of the divine attributes are in him. And he has always had fullness from all eternity. He is the eternal son of God, very God of very God. But God was pleased to have that fullness dwell in human form. In a a human nature, a real man, so that the eternal Son of God and joined the human race for the purpose of reconciling it to God. That's verse 20. To reconcile all things to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven. His sacrifice has cosmic significance. The curse brought on 
the creation by Adam's sin will be removed. You read about that, a more full description of that in Romans chapter 8, how the, the creation is presently longing for the glorification of the sons of God when it will experience a glorification. So there is this cosmic significance to it, but we celebrate this feast because he made peace through the blood of his cross, whether things on earth or things in heaven. That's reconciliation. It is making peace between two warring parties. Sin is the cause of the conflict between God and man. It's the cause of the separation between God and man. By dying for our sins, Christ removed that barrier. The Father now receives all who come to Him through Christ, our peacemaker. The curse that will be removed from the creation is presently removed from every believer because Christ died for us, died in our place. He made peace through the blood of His cross. We're no longer enemies of God, but sons of God. Now, that's a very, there's a very practical aspect to that because now, since he did that for the guilty sinner, those deserving wrath, since he did that, Mark des described his majesty, the majesty of this one who loved us and, and became a sacrifice for us. And if you want to get a sense of the majesty even further, just read the previous verses in Colossians chapter 1 about His role as the Creator and Sustainer of all things. He, he is our great Creator. He died for us. Now, if He would make that sacrifice for us and accomplish such a great end of reconciling us to God, what won't He do for us in any experience of life? That's what we should remember, among the many things we should remember who He is, what He did for us, and what He will yet do for us. Having done the greatest for us, He will do the lesser. Let's give thanks for the cup that reminds us of the peace that He made between us and God. Father, thank You for Your Son. We were in rebellion against You. We had committed sin from the beginning in Adam and carried it on in our own experience. And we were objects of your wrath, and yet you removed that through the great sacrifice of your Son. You were pleased that fullness dwell in Him as the God-man and that He sacrificed His life so that we would have our own lives, that we would be united with you and have eternal life. We thank you for Him we thank you for this cup. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, once again, it's good to see all of you here. And as I close in a word of prayer, let me pray that we have a good week and we're able to come back again next week. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness to us and bringing us together this Sunday morning. We have been reminded by the Apostle that while we live in an unjust world and uh, we face trials and difficulties, persecution and hardship at times, this will all be set right someday. Justice will be established on the earth. Righteousness will flourish throughout the earth. That's our hope in the future and in the present. You're with us, enabling us to persevere and to be faithful. So Lord, we pray that for one another. I pray that you'll give us a week of, of, of setting you first in our lives and living selflessly and living to your glory and seeking your kingdom and your righteousness above all things. May we do that, Father. May we live a life this week that is honoring to our Savior, honoring to the triune God. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for the salvation we have in your Son. And it's in his name we pray. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, 
To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Have a good week. Keep looking to Christ.